Hello, I'm Sophie Rodner from the American Chemical Society. Welcome to this media briefing from ACS Fall 2021. We're joined today by Dr. Sean Schwantes and Britt Robertson from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. They're confirming the pedigree of uranium cubes from Nazi Germany's failed nuclear program. Britt. Thank you, Sophie. So I'm, I'm here pretty excited to tell you a little bit about my research project, uh, as Sophie mentioned, confirming the pedigree of some Nazi era uranium metal cubes. Now the project is pretty neat in that it is, uh, ped sorry, it is predicated on the assumption that the uranium metal cubes that we currently have access to are in fact from Nazi Germany. Now this has been claimed uh, by uh, a number of people that have had access to these cubes, but to our knowledge, never actually confirmed uh, experimentally. So we have the opportunity to employ modern nuclear forensics techniques and some techniques that I've actually had the privilege of developing throughout my uh, doctoral thesis work to actually confirm this pedigree. And with this, we're looking for a couple of different experimental measurements to, to confirm this history. The first is uh, what we call uh, uranium radiochronometry. Radiochronometry is the process by which we measure the uh, decay products that have been produced from the decay of uranium in a single mass. We measure the content of that in the, in the sample that we have, and then we can use mathematical relationships that are very well known to determine the age of the material. So we'll want to measure these decay products and then confirm uh, the age that is produced is consistent with uh, the years during which the Nazi German program was producing uranium metal uh, in their nuclear efforts. There are a number of additional measurements that we're going to perform just to confirm whether or not these uh, cubes were from similar batches and even from uh, similar programs. So at the time, Germany was uh, working with, uh, sorry, Germany had two parallel um, experiments going on where they were trying to harness the power of the atom. Most of these cubes are colloquially referred to as Heisenberg cubes, like the Heisenberg, like Heisenberg uncertainty principle, Heisenberg. <laughs> and the other uh, scientist that was simultaneously working on this effort uh, was a scientist by the name of Kurt Diebner. Now, these two were operating in parallel, but at different locations with different uh, scientific methods. And we have a little bit of information regarding their different experiment design uh, throughout the 1940s. And what we'd like to do in addition to confirm the pedigree uh, that they are in fact from this era, but we'd even like to hone in on whether or not the cubes that we have access to were a part of Heisenberg's program, Diebner's program, or both. So this ends up being a really fun, uh, not only a really fun science project and science set of experiments, but also somewhat of a history project where we're looking for different information and, and archived information and uh, even, you know, letters written between scientists to try to figure out what we can measure and how we can actually make some interpretations. Um, John, do you have anything to add? I, I don't, other than you know, it's it's our intention here to uh, to use this fun project to really hone some of the new methodologies for nuclear forensic science in hopes, excuse me, in hopes that those techniques go on to be applied to real uh, nuclear forensic investigations. Thank you, John and Britt. Now I would like to ask you a few questions about your work. Um, first of all, can you tell us what size these cubes are? Sure thing. So you can see that I'm holding it here. And in that casing, the cube is five centimeters on all sides and weighs about two and a half kilograms. It just, I'm sorry, just under uh, two and a half kilograms, anywhere between 2.2 and 2.4 kilograms, depending on the field design and level of degradation over the last 80 or so years. And for our work, where since these are considered historic artifacts, we do have pretty limited access to sample to actually process. And so we're dealing with uh, a couple of milligrams to maybe a couple hundred milligrams. Thank you. How is the cube currently used by PNNL? Currently, the cube is used uh, for some of our international and university-based training efforts. And so we have a facility called the Hammer Facility associated with PNNL, 
where we bring um, delegations and university students to the laboratory and they learn a little bit about the history of um, special nuclear material as well as they have the opportunity to use handheld uh, radiation detectors to see how those detectors uh, respond to uranium metal and other uh, radioactive sources that they could find in their job functions. Um, what safety precautions do people have to take when handling them? So you noticed in the picture a few moments ago that uh, it is actually doubly encapsulated in uh, plexiglass and it has some uh, foam spacers in there. Um, all of this is to prevent uh, unwanted exposure to the actual radioactive material itself. And so since it is fairly old and, and it does actually undergo oxidation, uh, we, we care very deeply about uh, preventing any contamination of this uranium material. So, um, so it is doubly encapsulated. And um, as always, we use uh, the Alara principle at work. So we use our material, but we keep our dose as low as reasonably achievable. So we have enough dose you know, to, to do our jobs and keep us safe, but we keep that uh, to a minimum as best we can. How were the cubes initially used? In, as in like during in, Ger in Germany, yes. <laughs> so what we can piece together is that the, the cubes were a part of the final couple of iterations of nuclear reactor design in Germany, wherein they were using um, different reactor designs to, to assemble these uranium metal cubes uh, in hopes of achieving criticality. And criticality is the process by which a um, fission occurs, it produces a neutron and, or at least one neutron, and then at least one of the, the neutrons that was then produced causes another fission. And so through this chain reaction, you have the opportunity to produce energy by the process of splitting an atom, um, but you also have the opportunity to absorb neutrons and produce some of the heavier elements on the periodic table um, in, the, uh, in some of the nuclear efforts that involve producing plutonium. Um, I have not found any official information saying that uh, that's what Germany was doing, but I do believe that is speculation. Um, John, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, they, this was the purpose of, of their reactors was to produce plutonium for their uh, weapons program. So actually, they, they weren't uh, interested in the uranium itself for their weapons program. They were using natural uranium to produce plutonium, uh, to attempt to produce plutonium. Uh, all, all indications uh, suggest that they were unsuccessful in that so far. What happened to the cubes and how many were there? From what we've pieced together, there were somewhere between uh, 1,000 and 1,200 cubes produced between the two programs. Um, several of them have been lost to history, which is somewhat fun to say. Uh, however, several hundred uh, were believed to have been um, uh, associated with the ALSOS mission, uh, where the, ALS, uh, the Allied forces uh, ended up overtaking uh, the, the German nuclear facilities and uh, taking some of the cubes into their own custody. We think, uh, I might add, uh, that uh, roughly 12 of those remain today in the hands of private collectors and a few institutions like PNNL. Um, the majority of those have been lost to history, as, as Britt mentioned. Uh, even the cubes that were confiscated by the ALSOS mission most likely were folded back into the U.S. weapons uh, program stockpile. So these are very rare. Do you have any idea how the cube that you have made its way to your lab? Just anecdotally, actually. Um, and, and so we have no way of, of really knowing if that, that story uh, is accurate or not. We don't really have a huge amount of, of documentation on the, where this cube uh, uh, came from. Before your project started, what tests, if any, had been done on the lab's cube? That's a fun question because it's a little bit before my time. <laughs> Certainly, a uh, non destructive assay has been done on this uh, cube to include uh, high resolution gamma spectroscopy. 
that's typically not uh, sensitive enough to provide an accurate uh, radio chronometric age for the cube. Uh, no destructive assay had been done um, up until the, the work that Brit is doing currently. I might add, uh, this, this is also the case for a number of the other cubes that are known. Uh, so it, it's, our, uh, it's our belief that there's roughly a dozen of these uh, around the world. Um, there's one at the Smithsonian. Uh, our colleagues at University of Maryland, uh, there's a professor there uh, that is also a private collector. He has two of them. Um, most of these cubes have not been uh, uh, analyzed in such a way to confirm their, their pedigree. So in the tests that you have done to date, what have you found out so far? So this is some hot off the press information. <laughs> so um, thus far, we've uh, confirmed that uh, at least one of the three cubes that we've uh, been able to dissolve is uh, is natural uranium, so it's unenriched, uh, which is consistent with uh, with the time period. Uh, we've analyzed uh, the surface coating on one of the cubes, and the surface coating, uh, the relevance there is uh, the information that we have indicates that uh, Heisenberg's program uh, used a uh, cyanide-based coating to prevent oxidation of his cube while it was in use, and Diebner's program used a styrene-based coating uh, to do so. So one of the experimental questions that we had is, would either of these organic coatings have survived over the last 80 or so years? And if it did survive, can we measure it? And so thus far, uh, for the first cube that we measured, uh, which was actually from our colleagues at the University of Maryland, we have detected the presence of styrene which indicates that uh, it was at least at some point part of uh, Diebner's program. So we are in the middle of the extraction for the other two cubes and submitting that for measurement uh, actually like this week. <laughs> so that's pretty exciting. And to go back for a moment, when you talked about, um, I think you said dissolving the uranium cube, you're, you're not talking about the entire cube. No, no, no. <laughs> yes, sorry. Uh, so we have about 10 milligrams of uh, oxidized uh, uranium flakes that were kind of removed from the surface layers. And so we've dissolved just, just a fraction of that 10, 10 milligrams. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that question. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, now, uh, what made you, I don't think you've addressed this yet, but what made you think there might be a coating on the cubes? And has anybody else previously detected a coating on one of the uh, as far as we know, no one else has performed this measurement. And I have to be honest, I thought it was kind of a long shot. I, I didn't think that uh, an organic would last sitting next to uranium metal for, for this many decades and still be detectable. So, um, but the, you know, as I mentioned before, we've kind of scoured the literature for to learn as much as we could possibly learn um, to identify signatures that we could actually measure. And that was one of the ones that is minimally destructive in that, you know, I don't actually have to destroy the uranium to make this measurement. I simply have to extract a surface coating. And so, um, so it was our first pass and it would, as far as our exper experimental scheme goes, it's the first, I would call it minimally destructive uh, analysis in that it doesn't actually, you know, change or shouldn't actually change the, the uranium and, and compromise any downstream analyses, but it could give us a quick, you know, Diebner or Heisenberg differentiation up front. All right. Um, so what's it like to work with these cubes? Something that's linked to such a horrific time in history. What a fun question. <laughs> it's, uh, I would say it's, it's somewhat surreal and somewhat intimidating, I would say. Um, it's, it's kind of surreal in the sense that, you know, one of the most famous scientists uh, that I read about, you know, during my schooling may have in fact touched these same cubes that I'm touching. I think that's, that's really 
neat. Uh, at the same time, we're dealing with these historical artifacts that are in limited quantity, and we've got to get as much information as possible off of a very, very tiny amount of material. Um, and it's a lot of people are very interested in in the findings. And so to that extent, I, you know, I'm still a fairly young scientist and still kind of growing in my career. And so it's, it's really intimidating to have to, you know, be very, very on point and don't really have any any room for error because John doesn't really have a lot of uh, tolerance for, for messing up uh, limited <laughs> sample materials. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, I think it, it's it's kind of weird. I mean, I've, I've even had a couple of uh, email exchanges with John when, when putting the word Nazi in, in some of our writings, because it's like, it just, it just feels so bad. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, it's kind of neat to, to be able to, to to hold this material, you know, in my hands, because had they been successful, it would probably be very radioactive, and I probably wouldn't be able to touch it. But also, the world would be a very different place, I think, both, uh, you know, within in Europe, but also around the world. And that's kind of a, I, I try not to ever lose sight of that reality. Yeah, I, I, I would just add that, you know, uh, I, I feel uh, incredibly honored to, to have the opportunity to work on something uh, this significant. Uh, it, it happens more often uh, uh, than you would think in, in, our, uh, in our science. Our science tends to permeate politics and society in a way that I think no other science does. All right, now, Beyond what you've already mentioned, what applications might your methods have? I think that uh, some of the applications for these methods would, would really spread the gambit of any type of nuclear, you know, non-proliferation and safeguards um, activities. Anytime you really want to confirm the history of um, radioactive material, or, or some, some of them are, are, are applicable to non-radioactive material, but anytime you want to determine the history of something or, or corroborate um, existing, you know, paperwork or, or declarations or claims uh, provides an opportunity for this type of experimentation. That said, some of it is, is still pretty early in its uh, formation, and, and I'm going to need to do a lot of work to uh, validate my techniques and, and, and write them up and, and defend them to people that are a lot smarter than me. <laughs> sure that yeah, I, I, can add to I that. think, yeah, and I, I think uh, that's right on. I think, you know, there's uh, many folks before us have developed some fantastic uh, uh, analytical techniques applied to nuclear forensics. And the nuclear forensics community, in turn, has borrowed a lot of the methods uh, and techniques developed from isotope geochemistry over the years. Uh, we're we're hoping to 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 provide maybe some optimal uh, uh, changes to those small tweaks to those methods to to make them slightly better for the community. To conclude, what do you want viewers to take away from your talk? What's the key conclusion or message? You want to go ahead, Brett? That's a good question. <laughs> Give me one second to think on it. I, I think for me, it's, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, our science uh, provides us an opportunity to, to enhance uh, what is currently cap uh, possible through nuclear forensic science. And then beyond that, uh, it also provides us a, a really interesting opportunity to demonstrate that science to uh, the, the broader scientific community and, and maybe public uh, as a whole. And I think to, to add to that, um, two, of the, two of my biggest takeaways is that uh, it often does take a, a diverse skill set and, and a diverse team to achieve something like this, right? This is not just science for the sake of science, right? It's science and it's filling in historical gaps and all sorts of other uh, potential applications. And I think it's, uh, a common misconception that, you know, you've got the chemists and they sit in one building and the physicists sit in another building and the engineers sit in a third building and they never talk to each other. Um, that, that doesn't work on projects like this. We all kind of talk to each other and, you know, it's, we have a multiplicative um, 
impact on one another's efforts, right? It's not just one plus one equals two, it's multiplicative. And I think that's, that's really valuable. And I think it takes all types of minds uh, to kind of be put together to, to solve some of the more complicated problems that require innovation. That'd be my takeaway. <laughs> Thank you. Media briefings for ACS Fall 2021 will be posted throughout the meeting at www.acs.org slash ACS Fall 2021 briefings. Thank you.